So Dave, did you take any notes on where we need to go next in this game? No, Ted, I, I didn't have my notebook with me. I got like notes, papers here somewhere. Didn't it have something to do with the, the Hall of Stones? I, I don't know, Ted, that doesn't make any sense. It's all halls are made of stones typically, right? Was it the Hall of Groans maybe? What is that, a place full of bad jokes? Maybe it was the Hall of Bones? Yeah, it sounds like you want to talk about the episode three of the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon to me, Ted. Welcome to Nerdarchy. I'm Nerdarcher Steve, and as usual, I'm hanging out with this nerd. Nerdarcher's Ted. Hey, maybe it's your first time hanging out in Ted's basement. It's a place where we like to discuss news, views, and homebrews for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Sometimes we even talk about other role-playing games. So if you don't want to miss a single video, then don't forget to crit hit that subscribe button and to tune to that notification bell. All right, we did it. We made it to episode three of the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon. I want to say surprisingly of like cartoons that I've gone back and watched from my childhood, this actually holds up pretty well. <laughs> Well, I'm going to say loosely. I mean, it is still dealing with a lot of, you know, D&D &D tropes that just, you know, aren't really in, you know, in the niche anymore. Well, yeah, I would agree with that. But that being said, like, I remember them. I remember playing that way. When I compare it to other, you know, cartoons that I've gone back and watch, it's a lot more palatable. Like, think about going <laughs> back to Gen 1 Transformers or even, uh, you know, Thundar the Barbarian. Oh, <laughs> Transformers where you're like, okay, oh my God, something has gone slightly against plan. Run away! Every single episode. <laughs> Once again, um, the Dungeons and Dragons cartoon, they use that in media res right in the beginning. They're running away from these flying monkey creatures through what looks to be like a swamp or something. And we later find out that they're actually called simian bats. Right. And you know, lo and behold, they're Agents Avenger, uh, you know, who is constantly on their heels, but unable to just, you know, step in and I'm gonna just beat them up and take their stuff. So you, you have that typical villain who isn't willing to do the work themselves so you have that you know that fallacy of okay here is a reason why just because maybe he could be defeated they've got powerful items he doesn't want that to happen so he's got to use stronger and stronger lackeys just like what happens in a typical D, D game well really what is the point of being an evil villain mastermind if you can't have some lackeys the boss around and have <laughs> do your dirty work for you so, as always, you know, we're going to talk about what actually happens in the show and kind of D&Dize it and see, like, what kind of, you know, tips, advice can we take away from the actual happenings. So, almost right away, the magic items start to fail. Yes, I mean, they only made it through three episodes and they're already starting to go. You didn't mean that, did you? You meant in this episode. <laughs> in this episode, the magic items are, are running out of power and you know the barbarian is like, you know, oh, their batteries just need to be recharged. The other people in the campaign or the other you know, characters are saying, we're not in a real world, we're in a fantasy world, there's no such thing as batteries. So then when, when the DM Dungeon Master actually shows up, it's like, oh, they need to be recharged. <laughs> and Bobby's like, like batteries. <laughs> yeah, you know, essentially. So so you get that encounter just for to kind of illustrate that the magic items are failing. They barely make it through, but they do manage to escape. And once again, like you said, Dungeon Master Ship Master shows up to let them know what their next quest is going to be. It's to go to the Hall of Bones so they can place their items in the skull of power in order to recharge them. I've been playing D&D &D for over 25 years at this point in time and like magic items running out of power unless it's like an item that has charges or uses it's not something that you know is a is a common thing if at all so this this you know fuels my thoughts of okay well you know what could cause magic items to possibly fail short of you know 
anti-magic areas. Well, I kind of reiterate that I really do feel like this holds up, especially the D&D tropes. Because, mm -hmm. you know, that it's actually a fantastic idea if, say, the group has gotten magic items from a specific location, a specific set, a specific theme. They're all involved. They're, they, they, they have something that makes them all kind of connect it. It would make sense for them to maybe have the same problem, the same, uh, the same failure, maybe. And they could, and it does create you know, a, a great, you know, adventure for the evening for a session, maybe a mini arc where you're like, oh, we have these really cool things. We don't want to lose them. So now we have to get them recharged. Uh, you know, one concept is, you know, like, like in the show, it's like, oh, well, they only last 300 years and then you need to recharge the magic in them. And, you know, these may have all been a set for whatever reason. So that would make sense. Or perhaps something happens that only affects you know, these particular items. I wasn't seeing that it was a problem. I was actually seeing that you know it, it offers a lot of cause of inspiration you know honestly you could take it from the idea that it could be a, a session this is this is the theme of tonight's adventure your magic items aren't working you know it could be a mini campaign where you do have to go up against things that are going to be more challenging because the things that you've been relying on aren't working or it absolutely could be a hey as the gm i screwed up i gave a magic item that is too powerful now and oh, it needs to be recharged, but it's on the other side of the world. So by the time you get there, you have gained enough levels to be able to use that kind of item. And it's another way of doing it short of, no, you can't have that, I goofed up. Yeah, I, you know, as you were talking, that's where my mind was wandering. It's like, oh, the DM did a Monty Hall campaign and now they need to fix it. Oh, how can I fix it? I know the items fail for a while and you have to go on a quest to recharge them. From another standpoint though, of, hey, I'm the GM and I want to put these really cool magic items in and I want to give them a taste, right? And be like, and let them be just totally badass for a session <laughs> or two because they have these items that are way too powerful for their level. But then you take, then you pull it back and be like, all right, now they're going to be hooked. They're going to want that. They're going to want more of that. And this is going to, what's going to motivate them to go adventure. So, I mean, there's a lot that you know you just have the ability to take away and i'm certain you know you guys out there watching uh you know probably have even more ideas off of just that simple idea of hey magic items even though they're considered a permanent item they don't always have to be absolutely all right so once again this is the third episode and we get the third riddle so this one is you know uh in darkness look to the light now in all of the episodes they always goof up the riddle to some degree and when they first you know get to town they're looking for a guide so that they can figure out how to get to the hall of bones yeah and, and later on that that kind of comes up and it kind of um leads them down the wrong road but before that one of the things i noticed right away when they get into town the town is super diverse like there's orcs bullywogs lizard folk bugbears trolls like all kinds of monstrous races just running around in this town uh, i mean it might make more sense because later it's revealed when they're like running away from the these monsters because they try and they basically try and convince them to be the guide and Eric like totally bumbles it he totally <laughs> found his persuasion check and you know gets into a lot of trouble so they throw them a bag of coinage which turns out to be bottle caps <laughs> not coins so now they're super super angry mob mode now you know this, this is a, a a cool takeaway for me is I like the idea of a town full of monsters in you know a campaign world that we made long ago. It was a a, a virtual city of orcs, and it was was Gronor. It was a it was a great cool place, but it wasn't inhabited by your typical humanoids. And to have you know something like like this where it's not humans elves dwarves halflings gnomes what have you you know here you get to to have like hey look even back then you know this is absolutely a possibility so why not you know create something like this in in the world where it's like all right yes the monstrous races that are tribal and what have you here they actually you know have a government have a city have rules and you know have the ability to exist maybe their rules are different maybe things don't act the way normal you know human cities do but it's something that 
I look at is that, yes, this is something that I would want to put in a world just for its uniqueness. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, years and years later, Keith Bar Baker, you know, created a nation of monsters, Droam, with lots of monster cities. So it's kind of cool to see that even back then, you know, uh, Gary and the crew were doing it. So it's definitely a thing. Well, so they're running away from this mob and they see a woman and she's got a torch and they're like, and she's like, follow me, I'm going to help you. And it <laughs> and turns out, lo and behold, here's where they screw up the riddle. Oh, it's, it's darkness. And look, she's got a torch. That means follow the light. And what they actually end up following is Loth. And they, you know, they end up on a spider web over top of a bottomless pit. And it's actually, you need to the rescue this time. Venger gets all their items. And, you know, it looks like they're going to be lunch for Loth, but Uni manages to cut them out with, with his horn, as well as cut the, the strand that Loth is hanging from to drop her into the bottomless pit. Because, you know, the demon queen of spiders, as she's introduced as, you know, is going to fall susceptible to something such as, you know, falling from her own web. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so there's some hokiness, but again, you know, uh, it's a kid's cartoon, right. so... Oh, absolutely. But, you know, what that what that does show us is that the players, you know, put forth an interesting idea. This is a nice GM, DM, that is not just, oh, I'm going to kill you. Hey, how do you think you're going to get out of this? All right, well, hey, my, my animal companion isn't tied like the rest of us. Can they cut us free? Can they cut this? This is where an interesting idea is put forth an interesting solution to their problem, and the DM runs with it. Absolutely. You know, speaking of running with something, why don't you guys run over to the Nerdarchy store over on the nerdarchy.com website, which there will be a link in the description below where you can find Nerdarchy produced products. We've got Heroes to Hit Dice over there, fantastical mounts. Uh, we've got a ton of other products that we've made. We've got uh, enamel pins. We've got 3D printed terrain. We've got all kinds of stuff you need to take a look at. So go uh, go check it out and then come back to the video. All right, so they 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 wind up getting free from the spider. As Dave says, you know, Avengers got the magic items, but none of them work. So he pretty much is like, you know, these are garbage and just tosses them to the side. Well, no, 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 not yet he doesn't because he did, finds out the hard way they're garbage. Like they eventually track down Avenger and they chase him down. And of course, whenever there's a problem with Avenger who shows up, Tiamat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tiamat makes an appearance like every episode pretty much. And he's like, Venger's like, ha ha ha, I finally have you. I'm going to suck the magic out of these items and use it to defeat Tiamat once and for all. Uh, but the problem is the magic items are fading. You know, they kind of depower. He gets upset, chucks them. They get the items back. Uh, but earlier in the episode, one of Venger's spies was introduced and it was basically a shadow. Yes. And and here is another great takeaway is when when you have the ability to as dm control the the outlying images or you know things on on the scene you have a way to actually give information to a villain that only the players have and you know if you've got you know an invisible spy a shadow something that is, that is going to be super stealthy and unobserved you've got the ability to see what's going on report back to the villain and now the villain has the information so venger gets the the idea of oh these these magic items are not crud they just need to be recharged he knows where they need to go being a super villain and you know lots of power he knows where the hall of bones is but sadly at this point in time he's already chucked the magic items so he knows that they're trying to get a guide well how do you get a guide in yeah you know, the cartoon dozens and dragons i think they just show up most of the time because <laughs> in this case we did we got hector the halfling that just shows up well cheshire yes, cat style but he's not just hector the halfling as we'll find out later of course not he shows up Ch chester cat style there's something going on there for sure <laughs> so you know for the mere mention of oh we still need to find a guide you know his floating head is like well then maybe i can help you the part who is out of money at this point in time you know it's like but you know how how will we pay you what do, what do you require it's like i will do it for a favor later we'll figure it out we'll yeah. figure it out you know it's like okay you know and as pretty easygoing as a party is it's like 
We love that idea. <laughs> so with that, Hector is good to his word, leads him to the hall bones. They get in there. But then Hector is like, now let's discuss my price. So they get to the skull. He, they put it in there. You know, the ominous, you know, mouth, you know, opens and closes, you know, light show. And you know, they see that the magic items are indeed working again. And that's when Hector's like, well. Now let us discuss. And Hector, lo and behold, you're never going to guess it, but is actually Venger. <laughs> uh, but the kids do get some assistance because one of the things that begins to happen is uh, the spirits rise up and assist. Uh, but of course it's Venger, so they really don't want to go toe to toe. They always run from Venger whenever they can. Well, the skull begins to glow and light up. And they're like, look, it's the light in the darkness. So it, op it opens up and they realize this is the light that we need to actually go into. So when they step into the the glowing skull, the light in the darkness, they're actually teleported to safety. The spirits are able to, you know, deal with Venger, at least for the time being. Well, yeah, they fight back and forth. You know, you know, it's a kid's question, so you don't see a lot. But ultimately what happens is like Venger is like, oh, if this is your place of power, and he just blows it up. It looks like it literally looks like a mushroom cloud from a nuclear explosion. And in it, you see like Venger like looming over everything, but they are able to get away from Venger. The spirits, maybe they did not defeat Venger, but they at least stopped him for now. And that's kind of like where the episode ends. So we know that in 300 years, you know, when those magic items run out of power again, they're going to have to find something else. Cause I don't think that skull power is going to work. Yeah. The skull power is finished <laughs> so i mean again like you know the that artifact item putting it in there for the kids to be able to recharge the magic item is a great idea an even better idea because players are clever is destroying it after they get you know their power up because you, you don't want that to fall into the hands of the players it was really interesting to have the spirits step in and assist in it as well as you know them so being able to solve the riddle in order to get away from venger instead of just you know being a slugfest in order to you know defeat him and, and, and beat him through combat absolutely and it, you know it goes back to a different play style you know that fits more in line with you know the the lord of the rings where you do run from combat more often than to just stand up fight like what happens in to the, in today's typical D&D. &D. Right, because once you went down, typically that was it. You were done. It was a lot harder to get your characters back, back back then as well. So absolutely, that was episode three. We were looking forward to diving into number four next. We're actually having a lot of fun with this, enjoying watching these, reliving my childhood a little bit. And like I said, I feel like this cartoon holds up a lot better than some of the other ones that, that I've watched. And it's cool to kind of, you know, have those takeaway moments of, you know, the, this, this great origination of, you know, D and D in a visual medium, and be able to still like you know what what can I learn from this now? And also too like some of this stuff is like over the top, a little bit kind of hokey and in your face. But lo listen, if you played with some of the groups that I've played with, you really need that at times <laughs> because it's like psh, like you think you come up with something obvious, and you know your players will they get stumped, they never get it. You think you come up with something that's clever, and they're like you'll oh, yeah, never nice. <laughs> they'll never figure this out, and they just like right away boom guess. It. I've been on I've been on both sides of that mm -hmm. fence and you know I've been stumped and I've been like, well yeah, it's seven. Yeah, it's just one of those things that's like never be afraid it's too easy or too hard. It's been my experience. Indeed. So what do you think? Are you watching along with us? Did we miss something? Are there any cool takeaways that you have from the third episode of D&D the Cartoon? Let us know down in the comments. While you're down there, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. On your way down to the comments, stop by the description you can, so you can check out that link to nerdarchy.com in the store. Check out the digital products we have over there as well as the physical stuff. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.